Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it looks like it's 4.20, so it's time to start. Um, my name is Grzegorz Piwowarek. I come from Poland. Uh, I write a blog under foreigncorporation.com. I'm an independent consultant, which means that you could be my boss if you want to. Um, actually, this state will change soon since I'm joining one open source company. I will let you do the guessing, though. Um, I do trainings, and I'm findable on Twitter as well. And today's topic is immutability. Um, in the Java space, it's something that's, that's been trending for a while. I remember that many years ago, um, Java was very hesitant when it comes to adopting functional programming ideas. Java was very hesitant when it comes to adopting any ideas. I remember that Mark Reinhold kept saying that um, Java would never get Lambda expressions. But suddenly, here we are. Java is getting more and more functional. And sometimes, some, some mean people sometimes can say that, for example, after seeing one of the Java futures talk at DevOps, it turns out that Java is adopting more and more ideas from languages like Scala or Kotlin. And this is all true. And one of the things that Java is kind of moving towards is adopting more and more immutability. But um, one of the points uh, that people always make is that, dear Brian, um, if you only understood that if we had immutable, immutable collections, how better our language would get. Well, it turns out that introducing Im fully immutable collections to, to language like Java is a bit complicated. And today, I'd like to show you how. Because it turns out that immutability solves a lot of problems, but it also generates a lot. So let's start with a very simple question for you. This is a very simple method signature. It has uh, some input type, it has some output type, it has a name. And usually, at least in the functional world, if we, have the, the, if we see the method contract, which is usually defined by, uh, by types mostly, you are able to guess what, the, what it can be doing. And this is your task for now. You have a very simple method. Tell me, what could it be possibly be doing? Someone, someone said something out there. The, actually, the echo is very bad, so I didn't hear anything. Um, but I guess that's a, that's a valid option. Well, this method could be doing quite a lot. And well, I'm sure you are all like full of anxiety. You can't wait for the, for the major reveal of what the method does. So let's have a look. I implemented it, let's say, many years ago on my university during one of the projects. No, not really, but it could have been. So as you can see, the, what the method does, it actually takes the input list and adds some value into it, taken from some internal state of the object. It also adds some value taken out of a, well, which is pretty much a constant. It also orders a pizza. And if there is a full moon, it actually removes an element. But then. It adds even more, adds the actual list to, a, to some shared mutable state, and then mutates some uh, shared public static field, and then returns the list. I bet you didn't expect that one. And immutability is a great tool that allows you to, for example, narrow the potential error space. It doesn't allow you to break your legs in so many interesting ways. By introducing immutability or things like referential transparency or even things like Docker or infrastructure as code, those all techniques are designed to pretty much minimizing the number of moving parts that you need to worry about. The really cool thing about functional programming is that if you know that your objects are immutable, if you know that your methods uh, are referential transparent, and which means pretty much that they can't have side effects or any implicit parameters. Suddenly, it's much easier to reason about, about your system, about your code. Because if you are in a space, in a, in a typical Java project, which f floats in mutability, uh, dynamic proxies, aspects, and all these kind of things, it's really, really hard to simulate the actual state in your head. 
when you try to think about those thousands of code, lines of code and how they could potentially interact with themselves. And then you think about proxies and Hibernate and aspects, and it becomes unbearable. But if you work with language, with a functional language, for example, that doesn't allow you to mutate things, that doesn't allow you to do side effects or other stuff, suddenly it becomes much easier to reason about it. Because you look at the method, you look at the parameters, um, you look at well your data that you pass around, and suddenly it turns out that there's not really that much space for making really, really dirty things in there. And this is a great thing that allows you to build resilient and predictable systems over time. It might not matter at a, slow at a, at a low scale, you know, if your project is small, if your deadline is short, um, if you don't have enough people, if you need to ship fast. But if you are thinking about long-term maintainability, suddenly it turns out that things like this start mattering. So, for example, imagine a very simple method. I mean, very simple uh, user API, user class. The user has some properties. It has a name, surname, phone, possibly something else. But only by looking at the API itself, you can't really make any, any guess. You don't really know which, is the, which properties are optional and which are actually obligatory. So maybe in our particular bounded context, the name is obligatory, but the phone isn't. But maybe in the bounded context of, the, of your colleague from another team, the phone is obligatory, but the name not really. I have no clue. So the more mutable fields, mutable properties you add to your API or to your, to your class, it suddenly it turns out that the number of um, possible mistakes that you can make, the error space, starts growing drastically. And this is not really cool. Uh, plus, if all of this is mutable, I'm sure at some point in time you ever you put an object into a, into a hash set or a hash map, modified it after the fact, and then checked if it's still in there. Well, it's very easy to lose an identity of an object if you, if you play with mutable stuff. But now, imagine if we attempted to do the same API in a very simple, immutable, and well, boring and predictable way, then you end up with a very simple constructor which does just allows you to create an object with two properties that are obligatory. As simple as that. It would be much better if your language had, let's say, some null safety uh, guarantees, but it is still much better. And if you know that this can't actually change over time, this is really comforting. Because you can pass it around, you can give it, you can hand it over to other threads, and suddenly it's all safe because no one can really change anything. Moreover, immutability makes it possible to introduce quite interesting optimizations. So if we know that we have an object that's, for example, quite expensive to compute, you can is and it doesn't change over time. You can actually start passing it around or even cache it because it's perfectly sure, perfectly safe to just keep reusing it. What's more, imagine you have a list of n elements, well, of 14 elements. You know that this list will never change, actually, over time, which is really cool, because properties like size or hash code can be pre-computed and stored within the data structure itself. So as you can see, mutability not always gives you some safety guarantees, but also gives you opens up a space for potential optimizations. And if you have a look at the immutable data structures that were introduced in JDK 9, their implementations are quite interesting. Because imagine that you have a list of two elements. And imagine that this list can't actually change over time, which means that there is actually no point in um, investing in building a proper array list or linked, li linked list um, infrastructure. Because, well, if this list has two elements and you know that this won't ever change, then why bother? Just put a two fields inside it and implement all the, uh, all the list interfaces. And this will work, which is, which is a great optimization that you can use. Uh, but before we move forward, let's actually recall what does it mean in the, in the Java space for an object to be called an immutable. So according to Brian Getz from Java Concurrency in Practice, an object is immutable when three things um, take place. When its state cannot be modified after construction, when all its fields are final, 
and when the this reference doesn't escape during the construction phase. Okay, fair enough. And now, here comes a question for you. Is string an immutable class? I, I don't see your hands, so let's do a quick, let's do a quick test. Um, whenever we want to reason about data, it's better to introduce some form of calibration. So are you in the room? OK. And now, is string mutable? OK, fair enough. Now we can reason about our data. So if you remember, three things. Its state cannot be modified. All its fields are final, and that this reference doesn't escape during construction. So let's have a look at the, at the string implementation. So besi besides many different things, you can find, let's say, three fields. One is byte array. There is a final coder for compressed strings. And there is a private int hash. Whoa, that's actually not a final field. So something must be wrong here. Let's have a look what happens when it's accessed. Whoa, there is a hash code method that actually mutates the internal state of an object. So what do you think? Did they lie to us? Is string mutable after all? What do you think? Is string mutable? So as you, as you could expect this, it depends. So the, immut the true immutability doesn't really exist. At the end of the day, all your software is running on mutable devices. And as long as you know, uh, registers in your CPUs are immutable, you will never have a true immutability. So whenever we are talking about immutability, it needs to be, um, it needs to be respected only at a certain abstraction layer. So the question about uh, if, if I ask you if a string is immutable, the proper answer would be to point out that if you interact with the, with the string API, it's, it behaves like an immutable object. But internally, naturally, it will be mutable because of many reasons. Well, at the, at the end of the day, even if we have a truly as, as true immutable object as we can, there is someone that can do something really, really nasty. So remember that never take anything for granted. And since we know already that immutability exists at the, only at a certain abstraction layer, and that immutable objects can be actually mutable inside, this is what enables something really interesting to happen, because immutable objects are not always threat safe. It turns out that if you have mutable things, you expose yourself to, let's say, uh, threat safety issues very easily. And you might, you might argue that, that if, if some data structure was, was actually not thread safe, it wasn't really immutable at the same time. And I agree with you, but definitely it's something that you should keep in mind. So a real life example of that was that I believe Scala up to version 2.11 or 2.12 had a very interesting concurrency bug. So if you created a list or a vector of one element, that would be actually non thread safe. You create a vector of one element, you share it with another thread, and there is a way for it to be, pers to be observed in an inconsistent state. So did they lie to us? And this is when we slowly need to start worrying. If we know that immutability exists only at the one particular abstraction layer, uh, we need to start thinking how to design efficient immutable APIs. Um, Let's try to do it. Let's try to implement a very simple one based on Java util list. So as you might think, that implementing a very simple uh, immutable list might be, might be very easy. And it is. But suddenly we end up in an interesting corner cases because uh, we have methods that actually mutate the underlying data structure. And if the interfaces are designed in such a way as Java util list is, so for example, all methods like add, add all, or remove, replace all, they actually either return nothing or return some metadata about the operation that happened. And this is a bit, um, a bit problematic because, well, what can you do if you try to implement an interface like that? The only thing you can do is pretty much throw an exception or just do nothing. And both options are really bad. So that's very easy to implement, but not very user friendly. What's more, it violates least of substitution principle. Because suddenly, if this is your implementation, and 
other people as consumers of their interface or the abstract class suddenly we need to be aware of what implementation actually they are working with. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the remove method or sort might throw an exception, which is, which is really bad. And if you have a look at how other languages deal with the problem, the key to designing a user-friendly immutable APIs um, is still including mutating methods, but instead of, well, returning some metadata or not doing anything, those would actually retur return copies of those classes that we were trying to modify. The difference is that they would never modify the class. They would introduce, they would return a copy containing the, the requested change that we wanted to make. But, okay, so we can implement it quite easily, just introducing quite a lot of copying. But that's problematic as well, because that's quite a lot of copying. And when we are thinking, well, the way we pick our data structures, usually we, we judge them by their properties, by the time complexities that they offer. And if a method add on an immutable list, so it suddenly that it's not constant time anymore. It becomes uh, linear time. The space complexity is also linear, which is really, really bad. So, and this is where, this is where you need to realize that actually there is some trade-off involved. And it's not uncommon for purely functional languages to actually generate quite a lot of garbage. Because at the end of the day, it's all being run on, uh, by our impure and mutable uh, machines. And we need to figure out ways how to deal with the issue itself. Um, so this is how we slowly arrive at the main topic for today, which is persistent data structures, which are sometimes called purely functional data structures. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, persistent data structure, I mean, is this something, is this like a database or something that you store on a disk? Not really. This is the, this, the word persistent comes from a bit different bounded context. In this case, it means that those are data structures that pretty much are able to uh, retain previous versions of themselves once they, once they get changed. And you already figured out how to implement a very naive a persistent data structure just by introducing a lot of copying. And this is the, the, first, the first way we could implement something like that. The other appro approach that can be taken to implement something like that is the concept of a fat node, fat node, which means that a list itself could hold internally a form of a bin log or event log that pretty much accumulates all the, um, all the operations that ever happened. And based on that, you could recreate every possible state of a data structure over time. Um, there's a problem with this solution, though. Um, if you try to maintain a uh, a log of all operations that happened on the data structure, you will end up with a really huge memory leak. So that's not very practical. However, I'm trying to implement something like that at the moment at GitHub, trying to, um, trying to manage retention on my own. However, there is the third way, the most practical one that most functional languages use, which means leveraging structural sharing. And if you remember what I told you a few minutes ago, if we know, we have, the immutability gives us really strong guarantees. So if we know that object doesn't change over time, it means it can be safely reused, cached, or memorized, and shared among threads. And this is perfectly safe, because, well, they don't change over time. And I'm not the first one to talk about the subject. Um, for example, Oleg Shulayev from Oracle um, did this, a kind of similar conceptual talk a few years ago at DevOps in Poland. Um, but there is one detail I'd like to point you, at, point you at. So he used this image of a cartoonish unicorn to illustrate the beautiful and marvelous concept of functional data structures. And I believe that this picture is not really scientifically correct. Because after playing with those tools for a while, it turns out that they don't really look like that. They look more like, more like this. It turns out, well, that they are all, well, that those are beautiful and interesting concepts, you know, but the problem is that at the end of the day, you need to force your impure and mutable machine to actually work with that. So concepts are beautiful, but they actually represent a very dramatic uh, attempt at making those things be performant. 
So we learned already that string is an immutable data, well, that's a form of an immutable data structure. But is it a persistent data structure? What do you think? Is string a persistent data structure? Not really. One person. OK, again, it depends. Um, because if you have a look at all the implementations of string, a method like substring, you would figure out that, well, if string is immutable, if the byte array or car array internally is immutable, technically it could be shared with other objects as well. And this is what used to happen quite a lot. So, for example, if you implement a substring method, technically you could actually just share the underlying byte array and just apply a logical cap to it. Um, and that would be perfectly safe. And that used to be perfectly safe because you would avoid a new string allocation and, well, save some precious CPU time. Um, however, that would create a very subtle memory leak. So after, it's, I believe in Java 8 or Java 7, they changed the implementation and the string constructor actually does the copy of the byte array, just in case, of the, the part that it cares about. But, so definitely, string is not a person structure, but it could be. So if you really want to implement your own version of, you, you, you want to start your own implementation of the virtual machine, there is, well, you could do that. However, this would be perfectly safe, because string acts as an immutable object. But we have similar APIs exposed as um, in immutable data structures like ArrayList. So if you have a look at the class itself, you will figure out that it has a method sublist, uh, which, gives you a, which gives you a possibility to derive a new list from an existing one by providing the beginning and the end index. And that would be good, but the problem is that the underlying data structure is mutable. And the sublist method doesn't really generate, create a new list. It creates a new view over the original list. And I've seen cases really, really bad, like this one, where it would introduce a really, really sneaky bugs. So imagine that you take a list of numbers. And imagine that you want to transform the list of numbers using the Guava transformers. And then imagine you want to pick a few numbers from this list using the sublist method. And then you shuffle the original one. At the end of the day, it turns out that those are the same numbers all the time. Because Guava transformers as well, they don't really create copies. They create views that mutate data once you request it. And we had a situation like this in tests on um, I was refactoring some really old piece of code responsible pretty much for um, picking users, like shuffling users and picking a few of them out of a list based on certain properties. And I refactored it, and it worked. But it was a very old piece of code, very, uh, very imperative, very uncomfortable to work with. And it still worked, which was a bit, a bit suspicious. I got suspicious. I removed quite a lot of code, and it turns out that tests worked as well. So it turned out that it was a very, very sneaky bug that, that in normal world, where the immutability is a first-class citizen, wouldn't even exist. And once we know all of that, we can finally start talking about how to att uh, attempt the implementation of efficient immutable data structures. And the one of the easiest ideas that you can think of is the, a simple linked list, um, but not implemented in a way that you learned on the universities, but in a recursive manner. So imagine that each node of a linked list, instead of storing just one element and pointing to another node, it points to another to the previous version of the list itself. So uh, whenever, you, whenever you create, add a new element to a list, instead of make copying or instead of doing anything, you just create a new node, which points to the previous version and holds the new element. And this is really great, because you don't copy anything, and you get back your constant time operations here. And if you would like to visualize it, imagine you create a simple list um, of few elements. Then you create a next one by pointing to a previous one. And then you create the next one by pointing, pointing, and pointing. So as you can see, this is a 
quite a smart solution for the, for the, for the problem. But there's, it generates a bit of problems. Because yeah, as, you could, as you could see, you can add elements. You can add, you can add elements to a, to a list quite easily in constant time with zero copying. But what if we wanted to actually add elements from a, to a different side to a list? You no longer have, you no longer have the, the, the sequence goes only in one side. From the, if you want to add data from the, other part, from the other side of the list, it turns out it, it gets a bit more complex. Because pretty much you need to recreate the whole list from scratch based on the new object. And this is no longer constant time. This is linear time. And this involves copying, which is not cool. And it's not really a problem for most lists, because if we can add a list, if we can add elements to one side of the list without paying too much worrying about, uh, about the cost, then it's fine. So it's more or less acceptable. Um, but it also generates other problems. And this is the point where usually people start asking me or anyone else, so Greg, you are telling me that we built a recursive data structure where lists point to previous versions of themselves. So if we add a new element to a list, and if another thread adds an element to a list, which ends up pointing in, in which direction? And this is surprisingly quite a common question. But it also um, reveals certain misunderstanding about what we are dealing with. Because we are dealing with immutable data structures. And I believe that, I mean, I believe that one of the most common arguments for immutable data structure is that they are thread safe, right? Um, but we shouldn't ever be thinking about thread safety, worrying about two threads modifying one list in such scenario, because immutable data structures are not very useful for such scenarios. So if you remember the story about King Midas and his golden touch, you can remember that King Midas really wanted to be able to turn into gold everything he touched. And finally, he, he, he got to do that. The problem was that he started touching his family food, drinks, so it didn't end up really good for him. And I believe this is the case with immutability. So if someone tells you that immutability gives you thread safety by default, well, it's absolutely true. But it gives you thread safety by not allowing to do concurrent operations and sharing those updates. So you could achieve some form of threads. You could say as well that we could just remove multi-threading support from Java, and we have thread safety as well. But that's not the point. However, if we really wanted to share updates of immutable data structures between threads, we could still do this by sacrificing a bit of immutability. So the practical way of doing that would be we would have a one shared reference to an immutable data structure. And whenever, if multiple threads jump in and make changes at the same time, they would need to pretty much just swap the previous version of a list with the, with the new one. And as you can see, you need to implement this pretty much by yourself. You need to remember about the volatile, you need to remember about the synchronized block. And suddenly, this, this nice property about thread safety and mutability um, is suddenly gone because you end up synchronizing things by yourself. What's more, it's creating quite a lot of contention. So the cool part about data structures like concurrent hash map is that they don't have a single contention point. They is internally split into multiple different, uh, multiple different buckets that can be pretty much synchronized separately. So you, have, you can have a scenario where two threads are modifying the concurrent hash map. And don't actually wait for themselves, because they modify two unrelated parts of a data structure. But in this case, you always need to wait for the swap. Um, and so you could do it this way, or just use a dedicated, mutable, concurrent-friendly data structure. That's also an option. Or maybe consider a totally different way of sharing updates. Uh, and to make it a bit easier for you to understand, that would apply to any immutable data structure out there. So if you wanted to do the same with strings, well, if you wanted to share, let's say, a string and have uh, multiple threads, let's say, append something to that, you would need to do the same form of synchronization as well. 
some of you might be uh, aware that there are, let's say, log-free constructs that we could apply here. And yes, that's of course true. But the problem with log-free compare and swap techniques here is that imagine you have 1,000 threads modifying one list at the same time. So 1,000 threads won't, are trying to make nub, a, a, a new version and generate a new object of the list, but only one succeeds to make the swap with the, with the previous one, which means that n minus 1 threads need to suddenly abandon all those objects and throw them at the garbage collector, which is not really cool and kind of can generate a lot of performance issues. So once we know how to utilize the um, pers uh, persistent data structures in the most simple form, let's try to see what we could do um, when we move to a bit more complicated data structures. Lists are very easy, but how could we make a persistent set? Well, we already know one way of reusing data. So technically, we could just implement a set by using a list internally. But again, this is not what this, this, this implementation would exhibit um, properties and time complexities that wouldn't be acceptable for a normal set implementation. So here comes the questions. Could we do something smarter? Notice they said smarter and not really better. Um, we could use a tree for that. So if you have a look at the tree structures, effectively, there is some potential for structure sharing. Because trees are effectively recursive, so every node of a tree can actually be a, can actually be a, a new could be a start of a new tree. So imagine you want what would happen if you would like to add a number 42 to this persistent tree. We add 42, but it also generates a bit of problems because we can't really share the whole previous version of a list because we add numbers to, list, uh, to, the, to the bottom of it. So which means we would need to traverse back to the root of the tree and again, recreate the whole data structure from scratch. And only things that we could share are those black nodes on the 28 and 55. So as you can see, we are already getting into a space where uh, we need to make a lot of trade-offs. Because, well, we can share a bit of data structures between multi multiple versions, but we can't share everything. We need to copy quite a lot. It's OK for the, let's say, very, very big trees and possibly unbalanced trees. Um, but if you have small ones, there will be a lot of, a lot of significant copying. OK. We know how to make a list. We know how to make a set. Let's try to think what we could do if you would like to make a persistent queue. So if you know, a linked list implements a queue interface. So more or less, we could use a list again. But as you might expect, something like that uh, well, will work. Will, would work great as a stack. But, it, uh, but again, think about how we interact with queues. Usually, we interact with queues by adding elements to one side of the queue and taking them from the other. So if we have a data structure where we have constant mutation of the beginning and the end of the queue, um, that's not really acceptable for it to be implemented as a persistent single link list. So if you know already, if you know that lists are very good at adding elements only from one side, but very bad at taking them from the other side, so what would be the possibly one of the dumbest things you could do if you, if you wanted to make it work? Well. You could take two persistent linked lists, put them together, just one in the reverse order. Which means that you could be taking elements from one side in constant time, but you could be also adding or re removing elements from the other side in constant time. And this is actually how many languages implement it. There is one trick, though. So once you create a data structure by combining two different, let's say, persistent singly linked lists, we have a problem. Because from time to time, one of the lists will actually get empty, and it will need so there is something will need to be ha will need to be done, and in this case, it involves kind of rebalancing it or just reversing the, the other list that we have internally. But it's no longer it's no longer constant time. It's a bit more complex, right? 
because we have constant time only from, in most cases, but from time to time we will need to pay the price of a, a linear time. So if you do some black math here, you can prove that this is an amortized constant time, which means that in most cases it's constant, but from time to time it's linear, and you can distribute it over those cases where it was constant, so it's amortized. So it's more or less acceptable what we want to achieve. However, that wouldn't be probably OK if we wanted to implement a real-time uh, re real system using something like that. But you know, I'm sure that you wonder if functional languages came up with something better than just meshing two lists you know, together to form a data structure. And it turns out that there is a way to do this. There is an implementation of a purely functional, pure queue by using a tree. But not by using a normal one, just by using a variation of two free tree. And uh, for those of you that don't not know, the two free tree is a form of a tree that, that has a variable branching factor. So which means that at every node, you can have either two or three child nodes. Plus, in this variant, um, all data nodes are stored only at the same level. But you, might, but you might be telling me now, it's like, Greg, you promised us constant time access, but, but it's a tree. And if you look up elements in a, in a tree, that's, that has some logarithms inside. And, and that's true. But there is a trick we can use. So imagine that we, if we, what, what would happen if we tried to reorganize the structure of a tree itself. Imagine that the central part of the tree wouldn't be a root anyway, anymore. What if we took the closest nodes that are to the beginning and the end and pulled them out and created a root out of them? And this is how the concept of a two-free finger tree was born. So by creating a two-free tree and storing, let's say, fingers that point to the beginning and the end of the, queue, of the tree, we can have a fully persistent, pure uh, queue implementation. And Again, this is, not, this is amortized constant time, because if you, have a, if you try to visualize how updates would look like, um, that would actually involve re some reorganizing of the data structure. So again, it's amortized constant time, but it's more or less acceptable. So we found the pure implementation of a persistent queue. And if this is so pure, why does Scala and other language, functional languages actually use Bunker's queue, which is the, which is the common, this, this, poten this is potentially dumb example that meshes two lists against each other. Why do you think this is, this is the case? So whenever we need to make trade-offs, whenever we make tra often when we make decision trade-offs between two, let's say, two designs, and usually when, when we see that we have a clearly better design, but we still settle on, on the worst one, usually it's, it's performance. It turns out that the Q implementation based on a two free finger tree, it's, it has very bad cache locality. So if you remember the difference between array list and leak list performance wise, there is a huge one. Array list gives you a guarantee that the data is stored you know, one by one in memory. In linked list, those elements can be anywhere on the heap. So forget about any CPU magic like prefetching um, and putting this stuff in the cache. If you traverse a linked list, in most cases, you end up with constant cache misses and paying the price for doing that. And now, if you look at the data structure itself, we are effectively comparing this to a linked list implementation. But this one has a lot of empty nodes that don't, have, that don't carry any value. So if you want to jump to some distant part of the data structure, you would need to make a lot of jumps between empty nodes, and each jump would be a cache miss. So it turns out that in this particular case scenario, a simple did beat a complex solution because of performance and mechanical sympathy. Even though the, the naive solution with two lists is still effectively a linked list, it's still a bit more cache friendly than a two free finger tree. 
So most languages settle on bunkers queue. And here comes the, the holy grail of functional programming, which is the purely functional implementation of a persistent map, a persistent hash map. So this one is a bit tricky, because we really, really want to have this constant time lookups for elements. Again, we could implement that using a list internally. But it would work nowhere near um, a hash map, and uh, will be nowhere near our expectations of a hash map. Could we do something smarter than that? It turns out that the, the functional languages came up with a concept of hash array mapped try. As you can see, it's already getting quite complex. Um, so for a short refresher, there's a concept of a tree. And this is T-R-I-E. It's, it's not a typo, which is a radix tree. It's a form of a finite state machine, which pretty much uh, can represent, um, which is efficient for looking up um, data by their prefixes. So if you store a data like uh, my, my laser pointer doesn't really work. So as you can see, it, each node here represents effectively um, a journey to the, to the whole string, jumping by uh, prefixes that you can use for, for lookups. And something like that, for example, could be used for implementing stuff like, like Google search. However, it's not implemented this way. So we know that in a data structure like this one, we could have a kind of efficient lookups for prefixes. So what they came up with is this I figured out that it makes sense to actually use the same data structure for storing hash codes. If you store hash codes like this, you could use this for doing, for doing lookups. And if you have a tree structure, it means you can actually share elements between multiple versions of a map itself. But you might be thinking that, well, again, it's a tree. And we need constant time lookups for a data structure like a hash map. Because obviously, that would work as a hash map, but probably wouldn't be as performant as we would expect. And there is a trick that we could use. And actually, the trick that some databases use when implementing B plus trees. Um, the trick is to have a not very deep trees. If we use a trick of implementing a very huge branching factor, like 32, for example, um, which means that every node could have up to 32 child nodes, um, our tree wouldn't be that deep we would have a limited number of jumps between nodes to get to our, to our value. And um, let's calculate that. Let's calculate how many lookups would be needed for a persistent of the hash array mapped try that would store the integer max value of elements. That's approximately six. So yes, it's not fully constant time, but it's pretty much close. Because if you store all the data on the same level and the same depth, you know that you need five, you need six, or approximately six jumps to get there. So that's constant, almost constant time. However, quite a long one, because as you can imagine, that's still quite a lot of jumping between, uh, between nodes and quite a lot of dereferencing. To give you a to give you an idea of how fast the, the number grows, if we, used, if we put the number of long max value elements in some data structure, that would be 13 hops. Doable. And actually, this data structure was used by Scala and many different, uh, and many different other languages. Um, but since Scala 2.13, they implemented even a better um, version of that, which is a compressed hash array mapped prefix tree. And so as you can see, there is a huge room for improvement to the idea itself. If you start exploring multiple white papers uh, that's been around for a very long time, you can find uh, a gem is like trying to make all of that cache aware again. And this is how you end up with cache aware log free concurrent hash tries. And as you can see, it's getting quite complex. So as you can see, we started with a very simple idea of making things don't change over time, but we ended up with quite complex, quite demanding data structures. If you'd like to have a look at them internally and how they look like, how they work like, to get a feel, um, there are libraries like Waver or Cyclops that provide this. Um, 
I would tell you start with Waver. Um, because if you are a Scala, if you are a Scala person trying to play around with Java, you will be a bit less disappointed because the, the library pretty much follows the Scala um, Scala conventions. Uh, and if you are Java trying to move into Scala, if you play around with Waver, you will be a bit less shocked. And this is how we arrive for the main takeaways for today. What I wanted to show you is that the key point to making to implementing an efficient immutable data structure involves uh, minimization of copying and maximizations of structural sharing between uh, different versions of, of the same data structures. Uh, what I would like to show you is that in many cases it turns out that simple solutions beat complex because at the end of the day our models can be can be beautiful and pure, but they need to be run by something and in most cases, this is a mutable and impure machine. Again, it turns out that immutability is not a silver bullet. There are used cases where immutability won't play really well, like concurrency, for example. There are multiple ways of uh, attacking the problems, but immutability can make it a bit harder. And again, as you can see, trade-offs are everywhere. So if you want to do a bit more reading about the subject, there, there's a bunch of white papers. Um, around the block. Um, the, best, the best book to start with is the original paper by Chris Okasaki, a purely functional data structures. And there are a few other ones, but I'd like to point you to the one very interesting article, the, the last one by Shipilev and moving GCs and locality. Uh, Alexei proves here that actually it turns out that languages that have uh, compacting garbage collectors can be more performant than languages with uh, manual memory management. Because what compacting garbage collections do? They improve locality accidentally by swiping out unused objects and then compacting them together, which is really cool. So thank you very much for surviving till the end of the talk. And I hope you learned something. Thank you.